I'll begin by saying I have an awful lot of sympathy with the vision that um, Francois set out. Um, I would, however, question the rigour of some of his points of analysis, which I'll take some fun in challenging um, during this presentation. Let me start perhaps with just one, one moment of the overall situation we face, particularly on the migration front. If we step back a couple of years, in 2015, I think we were facing, at least for the European Union, an almost unprecedented challenge with the largest movement of people in a disorderly fashion that we'd seen since the Second World War. We saw significantly over one million people arriving in 2015. Well, we're still in early 2018, so it's a good moment to take perhaps a snapshot of the last 12 months. And here we saw, for example, on the eastern Mediterranean route, so arrivals into Greece, the numbers down for 2017 to 34,000. Um, if I take a shot of what's happened after the EU-Turkey statement became operational, we've seen a drop on average to 84 people per day. I'll come back to the lives lost at sea. Um, then, um, if I look on the central Mediterranean route, we spent, to be honest with you, the, the first part of last year extremely worried. The first few months of last year, we were seeing figures that were 30, 40 percent higher than we'd seen in 2016. By the end of the year, we'd seen a very significant drop with the total number of arrivals on the um, central Mediterranean route down to something like 120,000, uh, much lower than had been the case in 2016, lower actually than any year before, I think, 2014. Um, let me just come directly to this, um, I think, point that Francois made, that we've actually not seen uh, a loss of lives, at, uh, a reduction in the loss of lives at sea. Um, I, I can't share that, um, because if I look at the figures, um, let me take, for example, the EU-Turkey uh, statement. If I go back to the 12 months before the EU-Turkey statement um, was activated, there were 1,150 lives lost. If I look at what has happened since the EU take its statement was activated, and that now gives us a period of plus minus 22 months, there's been a total of 113 lives lost. So I don't buy the argument that it's made no distinction whatsoever in reducing a loss of lives. If I look on the, cent uh, the central med route, um, if we look at the figures, for example, in 2016, there was 4,581 lives lost. If I look at the figure in 2017, well, there's 2,834 lives lost. Just to throw out another figure, which I think demonstrates the role that the EU has also been playing in saving lives at sea. If you look at the combined impact of search and rescue operations that have been conducted uh, and with disembarkation following that, we're talking over 620,000 lives at sea saved in the last couple of years. So I do think we have to be a, a bit careful here. I would also like just to challenge a bit the idea that um, the conditions in Libya that we see, which are atrocious, unacceptable, uh, a stain on humanity, but let's not be disingenuous. These conditions have not been created as a result of um, an attempt to try and engage in almost impossible conditions with a Libyan, I won't use the word government, Libyan authorities who don't have control over most of their territory. You know, it would be very easy for the European Union to say, we're doing nothing. But what I will tell you, if we had done nothing, 15,000 people who we were able to evacuate from Libya in the last few months, funded entirely by the European Union, together with the IOM, and help them return home with a dignified uh, reintegration package would not have been got out of those horrific conditions. 1,000 people who, for various reasons, cannot return home because they face persecution, uh, threats at home, would not have been able to have been evacuated out of Libya into Niger and then find resettlement towards the European Union. It's not enough. There's still an awful lot of work to do. I was slated myself to go down to Libya uh, 10 days ago but was not able to make it because of the security conditions, but we'll be going in February. And I think we have to remain engaged. Not engaging does not provide a magical solution. Uh, let's be clear on that. Now, if I move on to a couple of other points that I wanted just to pick up. Um, exploitation, need for protection. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that this is a huge issue and constitutes a, a major pull factor. I think it's something we need to address seriously. Um, my colleagues in the DG at the moment are running a fairly in-depth review of the um, what's called the Employer Sanctions Directive within the uh, EU. We've identified, I think, two main issues. 
One, there's a fairly patchy record of implementation, in particular if you look at the frequency and way in which inspections are carried out. Uh, and secondly, I think there is a lack of consistency that when irregularities are found that sanctions are applied that can actually act as a, uh, a disincentive to what is at times actually the exploitation of migrants within the EU. So we're planning to come with a fairly detailed review uh, potentially leading then to Im legislative changes or clear recommendations to member states later this year. But it's an important part and I, I very much share uh, Francois's analysis on that. I think one other thing we need to do much more on is on really tackling some of the smugglers who are bringing misery and exploiting human beings. This is something we've tried to do a, a, a quite a bit of work on in the last uh, year. We've now created a kind of clearing house which is with Europol uh, the EU police enforcement body and which is allowing now for the first time some of the information and intelligence being collected from the CSDP missions to be fed into Europol. We're working with Europol together with Interpol, with the ICC to try and make a real difference. We're also building up a, a concept of what are called joint investigation teams that will allow prosecutors, investigators from both EU member states and third countries to jointly go after the money and go after the smugglers. We've had, I think, some first success in Niger, uh, but there's a lot, lot more that still needs to be done there. On legal migration, I think we just need to be ever so slightly careful about raising this notion of fortress Europe in which migrants are not welcome, in which they don't arrive. I, I recognise that it's very easy at times to, to have that impression through some of the rhetoric of our politicians. But actually, again, if you look at the figures, you get a slightly different picture. Take, for example, 2016. There was plus minus 3.4 million people arrived in the European Union for various reasons, some seeking protection. Actually, again, if you take 2016, the European Union granted 720,000 asylum uh, claims, granted, approved. That's three times more, for example, than globally the US, Canada and Australia put together. Um, and if you look at those figures of where the 3.4 million people settled, Many of you, I guess, would, if I said to you which were the countries, you'd probably guess fairly easily uh, Germany, you'd probably guess reasonably easily the UK, but right up there in second place was Poland, granting legal permits to a huge numbers of Ukrainians, many of whom were moving partly because some of the tensions in Donetsk and in the east. So this is an area where I think our challenge, and let me be clear on this, our challenge is not to stop migration. Migration is not going away. Migration is positive. We need migration also for our economies. Our challenge in many ways is what can we do to replace disorderly migration movements with orderly flows? Balancing as well the need for Europe to continue to be a significant actor, I would even argue world leader in offering protection to those who are in need, but also for economic migration. So what are we doing and what are we trying? Um, well, the first thing I would say on the economic migration front, it's not very visible. Some of you may not have picked up a lot of noise on this, but if you go back to our communication on the midterm review of the um, European migration agenda, uh, came out in September, and actually for once, as far as commission document goes, it's quite a light read and um, I think um, a bit less bureaucratic than some of what we produce. Um, one of the things we, we have in there is a notion of pilot projects for um, economic migratory routes. The, the discussions with member states here are, are actually, for once, advancing quite well. Um, we've got probably plus or minus a dozen member states interested. Uh, we're now starting the difficult task of matching the kind of demand and supply, looking at the areas, and this will also cover semi-skilled, unskilled labour and try and create pathways that can demonstrate the added value of doing this together. I think this is hugely important. I'm a very, very firm believer that actually one of the most powerful tools for disincentivizing people to risk their lives with merciless smugglers is if there are credible legal pathways. Also on resettlement, we've been doing a lot of work. Um, not great, there's far, far more that can still be done, but we're beginning to build up a track record in the European Union. If I take, for example, the period 2015-16, 
And this was the first time we've really done resettlement in a semi-organised way on the European Union level. There were 26,000 people resettled. Again, as part of our uh, midterm review of the European Agenda on Migration, we've launched a pledging exercise for resettlement in September last year. We set a fairly ambitious target of 50,000. To be honest with you, I wasn't sure we would reach that, but I wanted to stretch the member states. Well, today I think my views have changed. I think we will reach that target. We've already got pledges for 39,000 in, and I've still got pledges to come in from Germany uh, and other member states. Why is this important? Because what this will do is offer, for example, for Syrians, the direct possibility to reach the European Union from Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, but also into the central Mediterranean route, out of Libya, out of Niger, Chad, where people are being emergently evacuated um, from Libya, out of Ethiopia. Eritreans, you don't need, never mind the Mediterranean Sea, which most people concentrate on, risk losing your life by crossing the Saharan Desert, but where there will be the possibility to move directly with resettlement into the EU. And my vision long term is that really this is what we should be doing, pledging heavily on resettlement, legal routes on the economic migration front, and reducing the pressure for people to feel the need to move irregularly. I want to just um, pick up on one thing Francois says. Unfortunately, I won't be here this afternoon to listen to the debate on externalisation. Let me be a bit provocative. I think the debate on externalisation as far as EU member states are concerned is a bit like the Yeti. It's talked about a lot, but it's never been seen. And it's not happening. I don't think it's on the agenda. I think the planning is much more to enhance the work with bodies like the UNHCR, who have a role in designation of status and then work with them through legal resettlement. I am not a firm believer in offshoring. I don't think it works. The mere idea of trying to set up legal systems which would have to grant people the right to appeal and there's nobody on the Commission side arguing in any fora, as far as I'm aware, that the right to appeal should be removed. Um, and I think this is the model, not finding a uh, European Union Ellis Island. There's very little that keeps me awake at night, but the idea that we would build some kind of external processing centre in Tunisia would keep me awake at night. It's not viable, it's not realistic in my view. Moving on a tiny bit to uh, relocation, um, I think... Um, Francesco said relocation to date was a failure. Really? Was it? Well, if I look at the number of people that were actually eligible for relocation, um, it was, I think, 34,000. And already today, over 93% of those people have been relocated. Some of you may say, well, hang on a second. Um, I think you set the figure of 160,000 as your target for relocation. That's correct. But actually, one of the consequences of the EU-Turkey statement and one of the consequences of some of the work that Italy did was that the number of arrivals dropped very significantly and the number of people who were eligible for relocation also dropped considerably. Now, on Dublin, uh, it's... Um, in my view, in some ways, the reform of the common European asylum system, it's the 21st century's uh, Gordian knot. It's an incredibly complex puzzle and it's going to be a very difficult one to solve. I would argue quite forcefully that when you have plus or minus 200,000 people arriving in the European Union, we will not be credible if we talk today of a migration crisis. You tell anybody in Turkey, anybody in Lebanon, where 40% of the population are refugees, that we have a migration crisis with 200,000 people plus or minus arriving in the European Union, they laugh at you, and rightly so. It's almost, in some ways, a self-made political crisis because we haven't got a proper common European asylum system in place, and we still have huge divergences. If you take, for example, recognition rates of Afghanis, um, you have, in some countries, a 99% recognition rate. In other countries, you have a recognition rate that's closer to 0% than 1%. Well, it doesn't take a genius to realise that that will then affect choices made of where people try and arrive. Um, if you take, for example, the length of time that an asylum case takes, in some member states now, for, we're down to a period of um, up to two months, including the appeal stage for, for, for the simpler cases. In other member states, you're at a situation where it takes um, up to three years uh, with the risk during that period of people simply disappearing and you have asylum systems that aren't able to cope nor are they able to really begin to provide the kind of support for integration. I think that was also a point that Francois made that I have a huge amount of sympathy with. Um, 
We often talk about the costs of in, uh, working with uh, or costs of people who've arrived in our societies. I don't like that word. I think it's far, far better to talk about investment because that's what it is. Um, investing in people means that they are able to contribute productively and positively to our societies. All of our analysis shows that generally after a period of plus minus nine years, the European Union is benefiting very significantly from people who have arrived in our societies. But this is a huge challenge we also face in the next multi-annual financial framework because I think what, what our challenge is is to make sure that not just in our migration instruments funds are available, but that funds are also available at a significant level under the structural funds. And here there is one thing I just want to say clearly. I think we also have to find a way of incentivizing countries um, to make sure that regions or cities that want to invest in um, integration are able to do so. I wouldn't like to see a situation where a leader in a country has a choice of building yet another football stadium from his national programme or investing in refugees and I fear that in the one or the other the uh, football stadium may prevail. So this is something we need to use a bit of imagination on. Last point just as I end, um, how do we go from 37,000 today to 200,000? Well, I'm not aware of anybody on Dublin that sees the purpose of Dublin to relocate 200,000 people per year. That's not correct. And if you look at the figures, for example, last year, we've just said, plus minus 200,000 arriving. If you look off those people who would have perhaps claims that were not manifestly unfounded, recognition rates of perhaps above 50%, you're probably talking at a maximum of plus minus 100,000. And of the models that are on the table at the moment and are being discussed intensively, and here I would just give credit to the Bulgarian presidency, who in almost impossible conditions have started to get the discussions going at a technical level in a great deal of detail amongst member states. There is a contemplation to use de minimis levels because I think our only chance of actually finding a solution for Dublin and the reform of the common European asylum system is to make this debate much more than a debate solely about relocation. It needs to be about the way in which our procedures are conducted, the way in which we're going to bring much more convergence, the way in which we're going to be able to make much more, more use of the assets and resources of the agencies, both IASO, and I see a couple of the team from IASO here today, but also, for example, on the interminably difficult question of return, where we're failing miserably at the moment. And this is one of the challenges I think we face. Our citizens will accept I believe the narrative that we should continue to offer protection to those who are in need, but struggle to understand when we have people who've gone through a full asylum process, not and including the appeal stage, have a return decision. Why is it we're not able to return them? So I could go on for much more, but I wanted just to share with you those few thoughts and uh, try and provoke a bit of response. Thank you.